you lobbed you lobbed that softball up there, and I wasn't even going to take it. But unless you're just filming a person, that's typically not the case. Maybe God, you've I just can't. got loads of friends more than everyone what? else. Then, what? but almost always, Dude. if I'm if I'm taking a picture of people, it's um it's one person or two people. It's not like a football team all stood in a line. What? I, why are you guys arguing about this? <laughs> this is the most pointless discussion. Gentlemen, boys and girls and everybody else, welcome to Bad Voltage Live. No, it's not live. It's not live at all. No, it's definitely <laughs> not live. Completely just I mean, it's, naturally latched into it, Bad Voltage Live. Man. I don't know why that it, happened. It's live. That was amazing. It's live to the yeah. three of us. I'm it currently is, watching that, you. To be live. fair, that is true. Yeah, well, right now losers, we are not to ourselves yeah. live. Yeah, you losers not joining us right now. No, don't recording. say that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh anyway uh, welcome everybody we've got a really fun packed show uh tell us what's going to be happening in this show mr langridge we've got a long discussion our main piece is about ethics in technology right? um should tech companies take ethical stances on what it is they do what their software is used for is software just a neutral thing and the user's Take yep. on board all the ethical questions about it. We're going to dig into it based on some recent news stories. That's right. And you thought you were just going to get news, but you all are also going to get a bunch of news. So <laughs> aside from that <laughs> segment, we do have yet another beefy miracle news segment. It is beefy. Um, it is not necessarily Fedora beefy miracle, but uh, it is beefy nonetheless. And now, Bad Voltage. time isn't it is it time it is time for some news hang on oh, sorry you, you broke up a bunch there i was gonna say so, it seems like it's time for you to get a new internet connection because that was a little no, wobbly that was just me pausing for effect <laughs> I don't think you was, literally man. i was literally pausing for effect oh man your connection is lame dude you have to fix it it is not my connection there's nothing wrong it's with not Comcast. anyone else's connection <laughs> Anyway, um, let's do we want to just keep rolling and then you cut it to here or something, or should we start again? No, we're leaving I, this in. This is. I in. was this under is the impression the this was all in. We're not. Leave, in. We're not leaving this in. All right, we'll not leave this in. Honest, John O. Keep you know keep, what that means. Keep, 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 hang on, hang on, let me just in. read out John O's address on air. <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> cut it out. All right. <clears throat> right. Start again. It's time, isn't it? It is time. Bring it's us time news. for some news. <laughs> let's let's do some news. All right. Uh, which one of you Muppets wants to start? Um, I'll start if you like. Uh, yeah. a, bit, a bit of Ubuntu news. Uh, okay. I think, I, I think um, both me and Jeremy put this on our list. Actually, this um, you remember um, some months ago the uh, the Ubuntu desktop team put together a thing which collects um, statistics if you leave the box ticked about your machine yes. uh, and various hardware details about it and so on and so forth. Um, they have just released the first uh, the first bit of analysis about it. Right. Right. They're, they're, they're gearing up to release the whole data set, apparently, um, at some point in the 1810 cycle, so by October this year. But they've, they, they've done some, um, you know, here are some highlights of the things I thought was quite interesting to get a sense of what it is Ubuntu people are using so apparently 1080p is the most popular screen resolution it's all stuff like that right it's used all over the world um 15 percent of people are using the minimal installer which baffled me entirely i would have thought it was higher really well, such a high percentage of ubuntu installs are for cloud related things and if you're going to compete with alpine the minimal install well no no, no 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 but this is the desktop metrics gathering i thought it was uh, just it's just desktop install? As far as I'm aware, yeah, this is, um, cloud instances don't show up with this. It's like, it's part of the installer. 
Uh, it's like, got to it's it's got to be primarily desktop yeah, as well yeah, because yeah, it, the, va- this, this the is, vast majority of these machines, are, according to the data, have single CPUs. Yeah, yeah this, is, this is yeah, this is desktop stuff. This is not people spinning up cloud instances. Not well, good for all that, these right? people at home with 128 megs of RAM. 128 well, gigs of RAM. Are, good, people, good for them. Yeah, 128 megabytes RAM. I was astounded to discover that, <laughs> that anyone's got that much. RAM. You mean gigabytes of RAM? <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, w- I would also be astounded if anyone's running on 128 megabytes. Of Both are just as astonishing, actually. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> uh, the 67% okay. opt-in rate, what do you guys think about that? Um, uh, I was the- pretty um, I was pretty impressed with that, to be honest with you. That means 33% of people have gone, okay, we don't want that, which is great. So a whole lot of Does- people aren't interested, but a whole lot of people don't mind. I think the majority of people who would opt into this... Uh, I, I actually think that a significant chunk of people who are using Ubuntu on the desktop are enthusiasts, so it doesn't surprise me that it's 67%. I yeah. think people want to provide this information because they know it's going to be helpful. Yeah. So, no, yeah. I, would, I would agree. And one of the nice things about it is they're really open about this is the stuff we collect. Right. And, right. It, and it's not collecting um, geodata. Um, they, they've got a map of everywhere... Um, where everyone in the world is, but that's based on the time zone that you picked. Right? It, they, right. they don't geolocate the IP addresses and, every, and all, everything like that. So I think this is encouraging. You know, they built yeah, a thing. Cool. They said, this is what we're going to do with it. They said, this is the data we're going to collect. That is the data they've collected. And they have started releasing the data. You know, yeah. thumbs well, up. Ju- yeah. just, just to clarify, too, it is Ubuntu Desktop and explicitly excludes Ubuntu Server, Ubuntu Core, Cloud yeah. Images, and any other Ubuntu derivative. Yeah. I would, I would like to know, I know they didn't publish this, but I'd like to know how many people this is. Because this data <laughs> is interesting if it's like, if it's 100,000 people or a million people, then it's fascinating. If it's 10 people, then it's not fascinating. Yeah. So, um, I, like, I, I do don't not know, know why they didn't, I don't know why they didn't include it. Now, a cynic. Especially if they're going to release the whole data set. Right. Well, what, they, what they've said is they're putting together a website with all the data on it. I do not know if they're going to go... I, I think they don't want people to know exactly how many people filled it in. I was gonna, Mr. Oh, Bacon, honestly, what was this? What would a cynic say? I'm curious what the rest of that I, sentence was. I just think I think a cynic's going to say they had such a small amount of people doing this that it would be embarrassing, and that's why. Uh, now that would be a cynical viewpoint. I think a non-cynical viewpoint would be, um, you know, it's not relevant. The data's interesting, but I think it is relevant. I think I think they need to include that figure. Well, the percentages go down to a hundredth of a percent, so that gives you a there, minimal There are going to be, a, believe me, when the data set comes out, there are going to be a whole bunch of people attempting to derive actual numbers from it. Okay. And, yeah, I mean, it could be that the, that the response rate is really small, and so it doesn't look like they've got many users. It could be that it so far blows everyone else out of the water that... You just, you just go well. We should only care about Ubuntu from now on. And I just don't. I I don't know why you wouldn't include that information. Um, is is what is what confuses me. I uh, that's, that's the only that's the only thing. But I yeah. Uh, what well, I think percentage yeah. stuff is useful in itself. Um, because what they're trying to do is get a sense of you know if we um for example most people are using eight or sixteen gigs RAM, right. Right. So if yep. they are, I might, sorry, it might be four or eight gigs of RAM, I think, actually. Um, four or eight, yeah. yeah. Four or eight um, gigs, yeah, respectively. So yeah. if they're kind of pitching the thing so it runs really slowly on four gigs and you really need eight or 16 gigs, maybe they want to tone that down a bit. And that's the kind of thing where having percentage data for that is fine. But the, well, uh, I, I, the, the only people who care about apps, <clears throat> people who act canonical, don't care about the absolute numbers. Because if that's their users, it doesn't matter whether there's loads of them or not loads of them, unless you're of the opinion that there's a shed load of users who have managed to completely avoid the survey. Right. Which I don't but, think they're well, are. But I, I, the, the thing is, I, I do think, I think if you're doing any kind of statistical analysis, you need to specify your sample size. Now, there is a question around... Um, the importance of the, of the samples. I'm not a statistical expert, but one thing that I've seen fairly consistently shared in statistical circles is you don't need a hundred thousand or half a million no. or a million people to be able to identify an interesting pattern or a trend. I think if you have a hundred people and they and and they submit data, um, that 
and, and most people have got four gigabytes and eight gigabytes of RAM. That's still really useful information that you can use to make better, you know, not necessarily better decisions, but different decisions for Ubuntu. But I do think that part and parcel of this is that you should share what that size is. Even if it's a small size, like I personally couldn't care less if they had a hundred people submit this or if they had a million people submit this. But I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that if you say that you had a fairly small sample size, it will set the cynics off. Yes. I I think that's the thing. There is little benefit to them in releasing that number. Right. Right. <laughs> but yeah. But anyway, I mean I I thought it was interesting. I thought it was interesting yeah. that and to be honest with you, this is the first time I've actually got data like this. Right? Well, assume that Ubuntu users are roughly representative of Linux users as a whole, which I think is, you know, a, a first order approximation had wavy level is probably about right. I think yeah. it's useful for everybody to get a sense of this is the RAM amount people are using. What's what's interesting to me about this is it what this tells me at least is that people have relatively old computers. Uh, I don't know how like people it, are using Ubuntu with four gigs of RAM on a desktop. I, right, I mean they clearly don't gig, use Slack because just Slack uses four gigs of RAM. I, right, and, I the, think, and they're running in 1080p as well, I, and they have one C, and they have one CPU. Like this is these are old configurations. No, no, no. Well, no most no, C, most computers CPUs these thing. days do have one CPU because this isn't counting cores; it's counting yes. physical. Uh, it's counting, that's fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, they yeah. they have basically said since we didn't collect data on number of cores, just on number of CPUs, probably should have added cores to that list, and I think they might do next time. But yeah, right. so the CPUs thing yeah. is red. No, that's a, that, that's but, a good point about the CPUs. But I yeah. I agree with your point that they're not using the most super up to date machines. But I don't know whether that means they're using old computers or cheap computers. Yeah, I, I would genuinely guess a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Yeah, Fair, yeah. yeah. But if if someone well, goes out and buys yeah. a laptop that costs three hundred pounds, it's not going to have sixteen gigs of RAM in it. <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. No, that, and that's, we, a, that's, that's we, a good point. We tend yeah. to go out and go. Yeah, you think in terms of I'm buying a new machine, I'm going to use it eighteen hours a day for the next four years. It's quite reasonable to drop a grand on it. Most people yeah. not like that. Yeah. yeah, I open this once a well, week to do the, emails. I'm not spending a thousand pounds on it. But what's fascinating about this, without spending the entire new segment on this, no, is, no, we just talk about this it, now. We just got two segments, right? <laughs> what's fascinating about this is, um, is, is you would imagine a lot of people who are enthusiasts, like I think we, the Linux desktop, I, we know is populated by a lot of enthusiasts. They're certainly not the only people involved, but typically a lot of people who are enthusiasts will spend more money on on um, their rig on their on their setup so i mean i was just looking like you can buy for 154 dollars an acer chromebook uh ah, it's a chromebook that doesn't count it's, yeah, it's chromebook, like, yeah you know you can get a three you, for 400 380 dollars you can get an acer aspire which has got uh six gigs of ram and a six. terabyte hard drive six gigs yeah wow yeah, so... Uh, I might buy so that. That sounds be, like quite, quite a good laptop. Yeah, like, like you say, maybe not necessarily old configurations, <laughs> just kind of cheap. Maybe maybe, uh, maybe Ubuntu users, according to this, are a little bit more frugal, you know? So, well, have, or students who can't afford to yeah, buy as much. Have a, have a bit less money across the board, because presumably, if you're interested in technology and you've got money to burn, you buy a Mac, right, Jono? Uh, I agree with you. If, if, if I had money to burn, <laughs> so no, actually, uh, um, you, the most recent that you bought is the games machine, right? How's it going? The the what? Didn't you buy like a snazzy Windows machine to play games on? Oh no no no! I bought that for my studio, but I, stuff, yeah, yeah. But, oh. for, but I did I did buy a uh, Radeon five something sixty, and I plugged it in and played. Battlefield won once and was blown away by it, and I haven't switched it on since. Oh, really? <laughs> not a gamer. <laughs> yeah. No. No, I'm not a gamer. Although, on a related subject, I have a bit of news. Speaking about of gaming. news. The World Health Organization have, has added gaming disorder to their <laughs> disease classification manual. So, uh, this will be... I, yeah, so... You know, mm. gaming addiction is seen as such a problem that um, it's been identified as an actual disease... Um, and I believe that, you know, a lot of doctors will utilize this this classification manual in their practices. So uh, that's that's interesting to me because it's not a generalized addiction. Uh, people get addicted to all kinds of stuff, right? You know, there's obviously substances like alcohol and cigarettes and whatever, but people get addicted to 
uh, sex and uh, gambling and things that you don't put into your body, right? So yeah, uh, yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, so high end, uh, no. high end audio devices. Um, uh, that it's not an addiction. <laughs> <laughs> it's only an addiction if you know you've got a problem. Uh, it's it's ca- <laughs> characterized by impaired control over gaming, increasing priority given to gaming over other activities to the extent that gaming takes precedence over other interests and in daily activities and continuation or escalation of gaming despite the occurrence of negative consequences. That last right. that last bit appears to be the money clause, I suspect. Right. Playing games now, to the detriment of other stuff. I honestly when I first read this, I was like, uh, I'm not so sure about this. But uh, just th- since this has come up, um, I've had two or three people who I know personally who've said that they've had kids with serious gaming addictions, like what the, that seem to describe those kinds of symptoms. Well, uh, I didn't realize it was such a problem. Well, so. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not only is it a problem, this is... Um, this is something which probably ought to be uh, a main piece in another show. But yes. a lot of the gaming industry, especially the more casual end of it, are deliberately attempting to create that in people because that's how they get paid, right? Right. And where does one draw the line in between, you know, do we want to incentivize people to play games as much as possible versus it's doing people harm? Well, yeah. The, that is a segment. Let's do that in the next show. Yeah, I'm not just going to be talking about that now. I'm just saying. Yes, there are there are many views on that one. So anyway, just thought it was interesting. Yeah, nice, Jeremy. Also, kudos for what might have been the smoothest segue in the history of Bad Volta. Yeah, I was ah. super impressed with that. You've ruined it now yeah. by drawing attention to it. Uh, let's see. What do, we have? do you guys see? I think this is interesting for a couple of reasons. You see that GitLab is moving from Azure to GCP. Yes. So the one no. thing I really. Uh, yeah. yeah, so it, it was the one thing that I think is really cool about GitLab, the more I am exposed to it, is they are super transparent with basically everything they do. So from a data that they expose to dashboards that they show to the entire migration is a, a bunch of uh, GitLab issues, and you can see exactly why they're moving mentality behind it. Their Zooms are open so you can join them. Like the amount of all in they are on open source is yeah. absolutely awesome and a little bit refreshing. I mean, we, well, we had, um, when they, when they had the big problem and they did the postmortem on it, um, yeah. I, 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 and we talked about how they basically turned a PR disaster into PR brilliance by being open about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I use I, that example in loads of talk. Yeah. Cause it is yeah. so remarkable. I can imagine. Um, also, this stops all the people going, ha, oh, you see, you moved from GitHub because Microsoft bought them and now you're on GitLab, but they're on Azure. Lol, it's still Microsoft. Now it's not actually the case. Now, that's a question I have. Obviously, I everyone who says that is an idiot, to be clear. I'm just saying. Right. Now, did I heard they, that a lot. Do we know if Git, I haven't really looked into this story, but do we know if GitLab did this because of moving away from Microsoft from a the issue being open researching the move predates the acquisition yeah, yeah, yeah. it the right. it, the amount of uh, velocity and comments and other things in the issue greatly accelerated at, right around the time of the acquisition right uh, so I, I suspect yeah they may have jacked up their priority list a bit but no one goes from everything's fine the way it is to let's move to a different cloud in two weeks Right, you know, right. start start to end. Much but as if, if these kind of migrations like interest you, definitely check nah. out the. They have a really cool blog post and uh, a ton of information. So, <laughs> if yeah. you're into multi cloud stuff, uh, check it out. I think it's yeah. interesting. There are a whole bunch of people who would say, "No, no, it's fine. You just type deploy dash dash AWS, and then you're on AWS instead of Azure or whatever." You're like, <laughs> <laughs> not quite as easy that, as that. I suppose. That, that, <laughs> that is quite... that is the promise of Spinnaker, isn't it? And 4,000 other tools, none of which will do it for you. Next piece of news, Mr. Bacon. All right. Well, this is a little different. Uh, there's a, uh, a person, I think it's, uh, what's, what was his name? Frederick Cambus did a little, posted a, uh, an interesting little article that went up in Hacker News where uh, I'm presuming Frederick is a he, but basically Frederick did some research into what are the oldest um, domains that exist uh, the dot coms, the dot nets, the dot orgs. And I pulled the oldest list and I thought it'd be interesting to share them for our listeners, going from newest to uh to oldest. 
a couple of interesting things in here. So the number 10, which was on the 5th of March, 1986 was when this was registered, was bellcore.com, which is not massively surprising <laughs> given you know, their oh, position. This, the... this is Bell, the telephone people. As, as in so. Bell Labs and AT&T and all that. I'm, I'm assuming that's who it is. Okay. It not be. I've, I've not heard the name. No, it was the, it was the, this, this list gets gone over every year. It was the original homepage of Bell Communications. Right. right. Okay. The, the research Next. arm specifically. Next is HP.com. World's largest printer company. Right. SRI.com. <laughs> Don't know what that is. It's, um, it's three. You know, the guy who works for System 76 now. Gnome guy. <laughs> <laughs> he was ahead of the curve. Wasn't he like six when he registered? I, I'd, be, I'd be shocked if he was even six. <laughs> yeah. That's it. Okay. Good work, man. Way ahead was, of everyone he's, else. It's a non-profit a tw- Stanford research. He was, uh, he was a... Tw- Boring! He was a tw- no, he was a twinkle in his dad's eye at that point. All right, so uh, then we have Xerox.com. Again, uh, yeah. ma- not massively unsurprising. I've, I've heard of them. Not... Northrop. Wow. Who would have thought Northrop gets said twice in one bad voltage I episode? Know. I know. That's, wow, yeah. we are now part of the military industrial. I'm calling the show <laughs> military <laughs> industrial complex. Yeah. Right. It's, a, it's more like Space Raiders industrial complex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's that's going to be the next Northrop project, the Space Raiders. It can, they can be part of Space Force. Um, oh, God, they can. <laughs> At which point they have uh, to build a thing which is designed for raiding planets, and they can legitimately call it a space raider. It'd be great if it was green, because it's the only flavour of space raider. We'll have three boxes of those when you make them oh, Northrop. <laughs> big, big boxes, but uh, Popey's willing to eat them. Um, <laughs> Deck.com. <laughs> Deck, <laughs> sorry, Popey, that was uncalled for. Uh, deck.com for deck. uh, is next. Uh, MCC.com. Wow, the Marlborough Mag- Cricket Club. Really? They've been around that long? <laughs> uh, yeah, Magna Carta Cartel. Uh, <laughs> I'm assuming also. it's not what I would consider the MCC to be. Uh, no, it was a research firm around computer stuff. Last time I looked, and to be fair, this was like a year or two ago now, it was for sale for $1 million. <gasps> really? Wow. Yep. Also, MCC had a Linux distro. It was a wasn't a Manchester computer something. Uh, was, there was I think there was a Linux distro called MCC at one point. Yeah, um, wow, cool. Don't think it was yeah, there either. One, Seven no, years in advance no. of Linux itself. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was Muck C. Um, and then uh, he, d- next he one directed was... Charlie's Angels, the film. Muck sure, that C? was the guy's name. Muc, yeah, Muc C, no, or Muc G, or Muc H, or something. Moving along. Was, sorry. Chuck, Ch- Chuck D. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have think.com. Aretha Franklin's um, domain. <laughs> I, uh, I would assume that IBM would own that by now, but the last time I checked, most of these were down, because I think they're getting hammered by nerds off... Uh, uh, off Hacking News. Off Hacking News. Uh, then the next one, second in line, is BBN.com, which is Raytheon. Again, Raytheon, Raytheon gets mentioned yeah. twice. Uh, right, well, Raytheon, considering BBN. DARPA funded the internet, it's not surprising that a lot of their uh, domains B- are... BBN, they were Bolt, Baronek, and Newman, I think, was the company. They did a whole bunch of really early... Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I think that, was actually cor- that sounds correct. I yeah, know, but... they did a whole load of internet stuff. They, you see their name showing up in UUCP bang paths and stuff like that. <laughs> That is not the name of the show, <laughs> okay? <laughs> UCP Bangpa. Um, and then number one is Symbolics.com. And yeah. I went there. It took ages to load because it's getting. Ha- it's probably sat on like a 486DX266 with 128 <laughs> megabytes of RAM. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, it's probably locked in the university closet and they've built a brick wall in front Someone of Someone hit the turbo button. Someone, quickly, hacking <laughs> user a- knocking, hit the turbo button. And... Uh, and it, that site literally just says, hey, this is the oldest domain on the internet. <laughs> wow. We've been featured on CNN. Okay, so, so uh, Symbolics.com. As we record this, that was uh, 33 years ago. And you still yep. don't know how to make decent trackpads for laptops. So maybe you could get better at it. <laughs> That's synaptic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what does Symbolics right. even do? <laughs> Didn't they do Lisp stuff? I don't know. Oh, I think they made like list list. machines or something like that really early on. But yeah, anyway. I, I just had a micro sleep while you said the word list. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, I thought that'd be an interesting jump. Apparently, people say this every year, according to Jeremy, but, uh, you know, 
I uh, thought we'd go through it. Anyway, I, what's next? I, I, I do think it's interesting. Um, so, yeah, it uh, Akon, singer, who I just yeah, thought was a singer and that was it. Apparently, he wants to found a techno city in Senegal and fund it with cryptocurrency, right? Um, he says blockchain technology and cryptocurrency could be the saviour for Africa in many ways. And people have chucked around phrases like a real-life Wakanda. Right? Now, I brought this up in... Um, Hang on, what's Wakanda? I don't know what the, that is. The, 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 the amazing Panther country from Black Panther, where everyone's, uh, oh, everything's on like oh, mad hovering mono rails and, uh, okay. and incredible unfolding clothes technology and stuff like this, just, right? Just to be clear, to set context on this, when he brought it up, I read the article, the planned community name would be called Akon Crypto City, and when asked for specifics about how things would work and just general logistics, et cetera, et cetera, he said, I don't know. I come with the concepts and let the geeks figure it out. <laughs> right. Now, bear with me, right? We've, um, uh, as, you can, as you can imagine, we put together the show over the previous couple of weeks since the last show. So I brought this up a little while ago. Um, our, bo- our boy Jezza rained down on this parade with great fury. <laughs> <laughs> However, right, and to be honest with you, I got a lot of sympathy for the point of view that this is unutterable bullshit up to Mars One levels of. Un- I'm pretty of sure they're going to have a space. I'm pretty sure they'll have a space force, uh, you know, launch inside there. <laughs> well, as no, well. I mean, they, um, uh, Acon's been given a whole bunch of land by the president of Senegal to do this on, right? Um, a little tiny part of me. Kind of likes the idea. You used to get company towns, basically, right? And some of them were terrible, awful ones attached to the mine where everyone got paid in company scrip and you had to use that at the company store. And it was uh, run by, you know, everyone, everyone in the town was terrorized by the foreman from the mine and whatever. But there were also, uh, there was a little period of philanthropists founding towns that they thought were going to be amazing. And some of them were. I mean, things like Hershey, right? Which is where the chocolate bar people are from. The guy who's out of the company founded the town with the idea that it would be this amazing place. And it kind of is. Right? It's not Wakanda. Don't get me wrong. But there's there's still kind of a lot of that. (laughs) Yeah. Well, not necessarily founding the towns, but there's still, I mean, you know, it's, you know, across the US, there's, Thousands of little towns with one major employer, and the major employer yeah. plays a heavy role in their local community. Oh, yeah, certainly. There, there yeah. Are, don't get me wrong. There are lots and lots of company towns. Always have been. Some good, some bad. What I like is this kind of... There was kind of an idea that if you founded a place, and then you could make it right, a little bit of paradise. It wasn't just building a great big housing estate so you had somewhere to put the workers for your factory. Um, I'm not necessarily sure that I bought the idea. Some of them were good, some of them were bad. You look at, say, Bourneville here in the UK, right, which is now a, a district of Birmingham, but it was built by Josiah Cadbury. Um, right. And it was essentially built by him as a town. So when he built the Cadbury factory, the staff had somewhere to live. But he was a Quaker, so that there were no pubs. And there are still no pubs in Bourneville, right? So I'm not necessarily... Oh, really? Yeah, still. So I'm still not necessarily sure I buy this, but something like Port Sunlight or the Hersh or Hershey or a place like that, I I kind of have a sneaking admiration for someone who's actually prepared to get up and do this sort of thing. I think it should be the government's job, but if the government aren't doing it, what about people who are, who are willing to get up and say, "This is my idea"? Off you go, nerds. <laughs> well, yeah, those ideas they get, do get rained upon with the great vengeance <laughs> and furious anger. Sounds massively transformational to me. Well, I don't know. yeah, there, um, there is there, there is a question of even if it is a good idea, is he the guy to do it? And I don't know, but I thought it was an interesting piece of news anyway. Yeah, I uh, uh, I I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say this is not going to happen. Um, if put it this way, if Disney couldn't make Epcot work, I don't think Akon's going to make this work. So, well, we should... you know, Epcot was supposed to be a, a modern techno city and didn't happen. It was just a, a theme. It's now an eighty style theme. It's now an eighty style, so. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I have a bit of news. Can I share some news? Yeah, do it. Um, uh, apparently, Tencent um, have joined the Linux Foundation 
with the highest level of sponsorship, um, which I think is interesting because Tencent are a pretty huge force in China, right? I mean, oh yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, Microsoft when they joined the LF, that was kind of seen as a, a bit of a watershed moment uh, in some ways. And Tencent joining, you know, that's uh, that's a big deal as well. So. You know, I just think this is another example of the continued growth of open source. I don't think it's necessarily a lot to talk about. I just think it's interesting that they've joined. So, you know, the, the Linux Foundation are becoming quite a center of gravity around this stuff. So. Yeah, which is, I mean, I don't know why they're called Tencent rather than 0.66 yuan. But nonetheless, <laughs> they do seem to be a really, really <laughs> How big How long game. have you been sitting on that one? Well, you know. <laughs> Jesus. Oh my god. But I yeah. wish you could I wish you could conjure up a hashtag, hashtag dad joke, and literally push it through the screen into another part of the world. I'm just there for you, right? I bet, hashtag I bet you can dad do that jokes. A- I bet you can do that in Akon's technical town. I bet I bet you can, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, I mean this is a good thing, right? Uh, that they're involved, yeah, with, I think they're involved so. with the LF. Yeah. So yeah, I just thought it was interesting. Yes. Uh it is. Jezza. Do we have anything else? I got yeah. one more left. Do you see the uh, Supreme Court uh, upheld the Fourth Amendment applies to cell phone tracking? No. Um, I did, but I don't think I properly understand this. I went away and read a couple of articles about it after you also, mentioned it. Also, what's, but... uh, what's the Fourth Amendment? You live uh, there, The right man. to unreasonable searches and seizures. <laughs> okay, just check it. I don't know. From everything I see in the news, it seems like there are only two amendments, the first and the second one. That's all well, anyone talks about in this country. So, uh, well, fine. Yes. Okay. I tell you, we won't make any, we won't make you quarter soldiers in your house. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so that doesn't, so you said that doesn't apply to cell phones? No. So it historically hadn't. Right. Now they're saying that it does. So this is a, a, a good thing for privacy, so I, I think. As I understand this, and I'm not sure I understand this correctly. Before, um, if the police wanted to look at your cell phone records, you know, where, where you were, which cell, phone, which cell towers you were on and everything, they didn't need a warrant to do it, and now they do. Is that Right, so correct? before they were using something called third-party doctrine, which was codified like in the 70s when obviously things like this didn't apply. Uh, courts had been taking third-party doctrine to apply to data like cell phone uh, location information, and it was... Not really known how the Supreme Court was going to come down on this. For those of you maybe not from the U.S. and not familiar with the Supreme Court, uh, there's typically four people on one side and four people on the other on the current bench. So it it really takes a swing person in a lot of cases, and that's a little bit uh, unknowable going into these. But Roberts was the one. uh, So it's usually Kagan, Sotomayor, Ginsburg, Breyer on one side, Kennedy, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch on the other. Uh, Gorsuch's a little bit of a wild card. Roberts a little bit of a wild card in some cases, depending on specifics. Uh, so Roberts was the one that flipped here. So it was, uh, I, I think, up in the air, really, whether this was going to be the case. But now the Fourth Amendment does officially protect cell phone location information. So uh, This is basically an unalloyed good thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Hooray. Thumbs up for this. What, what, what do we think is the, you know, um, I watched this really great documentary a few weeks ago with Erica about the CIA. It was fascinating. And they had, like, CIA directors from, you know, the last 20 years on there. What does this mean, do you think, within the context of, like, you know, terrorism prevention and stuff like that? Like, the kind of thing where if they if they suspect that somebody is a terrorist, they've got a reasonable, like, they've got reasonable evidence to suggest that's the case. Then it's not going to be a problem. If you've got right, reasonable evidence, you can get a warrant. Get a warrant. Right. I'm assuming they just get a warrant and off they go. Yeah, and they can, this is just they like phone it, tapping, right? Right. right. Or or anything else. If you if you've got reasonable evidence, you present it to a court. You get a warrant. You get, or present it to a judge. You get a warrant. You're good. Right, right, right. So I mean, what in, does that, this in, that, in that case, I assume they'd get a visa warrant. No one would even know about it. So well, it really yes. right. change that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that in itself is a whole segment. Yeah, from yeah, yeah. Show. A whole segment, a whole segment <laughs> about the fight court. But Actually, that. let's not have a segment on that. I don't want to talk about freaking secret courts. Yeah, uh, um, but yeah. So what change was before? They could go, we haven't got these blevins for this guy, but lol, we're allowed to look anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's like, wow, he's really good at Candy Crush Saga. <laughs> okay. I, I, um, I believe this is just cell tower records, right, Jeremy? Yes, correct. And that's essentially position. Can you even tell who someone called from that? You can't get the contents of the call, but... I don't... 
believe so, but I did right. not. That that was yeah, that me, was one of the things I say. wasn't sure about. I understand the basic principle. If you, because if you know which cell towers someone's phone connected to, because obviously your phone's connecting to cell towers all the time, even if you're not using it. Right. Yeah. So you could basically track yeah. someone around the place, and yeah. that they now can't get at. But I don't know whether they could also get. Whether it now needs a warrant to also find out who you called, or whether I don't you think a this changes the that context. Right. Okay. I, that that I didn't know. It's U.S. only stuff, right? By the way, I have one final bit of news from my side. Okay. Did you know that Inst- Instagram is worth more than a billion dollars, according to a report from Bloomberg? I didn't think it was a um, billion. It's not. Uh, Instagram is worth a oh. hundred billion dollars. That's the, what, that's the correct missed number. Off two, r- missed off two of that was a. <laughs> Faux pas, 100 billion. Yeah. More than 100 billion. Oh, it, yeah, was a bit, it cost a billion to buy it, like 10 years yeah. ago, whatever it was. Wasn't it 18 billion? I thought it was a billion dollars. Buy- and that was a big deal. I thought they bought it for 18 billion. Oh. It's not a billion. If, 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 if Microsoft acquired GitHub for 7 billion. Well, yeah, but remember, Facebook bought Instagram ages ago in like internet time, right? Not actually ages ago. Like the the three- Instagram acquisition was definitely a billion dollars. Yeah, that's what I thought. And that was a huge deal. It was like, it, it was like I, oh my God, a billion dollars for Instagram? Oh, they, they're, just a, they're just a photo host. That's ridiculous. Yeah. I thought it was more than that. So this is, I don't think so. Well, so, so this is literally the yeah, you're right. hundred. Don't billion. forget, it was what going on six, seven years. I mean, yeah. it was a long time ago. Yeah, it they was. bought them very early. Yes, and I'll tell you what, they're doing an awful lot of stuff. Did you see that Instagram are now doing a essentially a YouTube competitor, but for vertical video? Drives me bonkers. Don't do vertical video. <laughs> right. I think I. Quite I did li- see it. Yes, I quite like the idea that. Um, yeah, don't do vertical video because it looks rubbish on YouTube or whatever. But it's fine if you're using if you're watching it on a phone. It's great. No, but don't do right. vertical video because the way your eyes work is that there's a large horizontal <laughs> field and a short vertical field. So why don't you optimize the video for the way you see the world? Because the thing you're filming almost all the time is people who are tall and thin. Present company accepted. Oh. <laughs> that's nothing. See, that's I wasn't even to say you, lobbed, Jeremy. you lobbed that softball up there, and I wasn't even going to take it. But unless you're just filming a person, that's typically not the case. Maybe God, you've I just can't. got loads of friends more than everyone what? else. Then, what? but almost always, Dude. if I'm if I'm taking a picture of people, it's um, it's one person or two people. It's not like a football team all stood in a line. What? I, why are you guys arguing about this? <laughs> this is the most pointless discussion. Also, I just looked it up. I was getting confused with WhatsApp. That was 19 billion. Right. Uh, so uh, that's where I was getting confused. Apparently, uh, they have a billion users on, on Instagram. And they're, I was thinking when I saw that, I was like, where do they make their money from? And apparently, their expected revenue over the next year is going to be 10 billion. Yeah. Uh, so don't know, but they're making money. So, I I don't quite understand how they're getting ten bucks per user. That seems like a lot I, to me. I don't. Yeah, I don't understand how they make it. I do not. All right, people, write in and let us know, or go to the forum, or go to Slack, yeah. or please explain uh, to uh, us how Instagram make money and how we can get ten billion dollars. the Matrix. Yeah, because I don't know. Um, I mean, if I you can make if you make ten dollars per user, I could build a thing just us three user, and I would make thirty bucks. That's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, barbecue pad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think barbecue so, pad even made that much, did it? Uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> yes. All right. Anything else? No, we're good. Are we done? All right. So in January, Microsoft published a blog post um, enormously excited about the contracts it signed with ICE, the um, United States immigration people, right? And wrapper. Recent- <laughs> Sorry. I, I can- don't believe <laughs> either ice Tea or Ice Cube would be particularly happy with that characterization, <laughs> man. <laughs> and, and Cube doesn't live that far from you, I don't think, so I should uh, shut up. I take it, I t- I take it. We'll cut that from the show. <laughs> um, All right. Recently, ICE has been in the news quite a lot uh, about (laughs) separating children from parents and all this kind of thing. Microsoft, therefore, got a whole bunch of pushback about this to the point where Satya himself wrote... uh, They they, they did a blog post from their head of legal. Satya himself wrote an email out to loads and loads of people basically walking it back, right? 
uh, in Google yeah. were part of Project Maven, which was a U.S. military AI project. In April, 3,100 of their employees signed a petition requesting they pull out, um, and they and basically they walked it back. They said that no, was only a little small project, and we're not going to renew the contract when it comes up. Right, right, right. There's a big question about should tech companies take ethical stances on what their tech's being used for and who they're helping? Or is the software industry just like a neutral provider of technology and the users are the people who have to deal with all the ethical questions? Now, this has been a thing for a long time. This predates technology, yeah. right? People have been talking about this for science stuff. Ever, ever since yeah. governments and companies have existed, yes. this has been a question. <laughs> yeah. yes. it's, so. it, it, it's a big question. But it seems right. to be coming up quite a lot at the moment for our industry. And I'm interested in your thoughts. Big yeah. topic, this one. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, what, one thing I would say is the um, there, there, there are uh, a couple of challenges with this, I think, yeah. is that one is anytime you talk about ethics, there is the question of what is ethics. And we all draw our ethical lines in similar ways and in different ways, right? So I think we would all agree that murder is unethical. Yes. Right. That's a bad thing. Rape is unethical. Child abuse is unethical. Yep. These are, you know, with relative exceptions of, you know, people who are pedophiles and rapists and murderers. Generally, we consider these to be bad things in society. But then, you know, um, I actually wrote a blog post about this recently. I don't think that proprietary software is unethical. Sure. Uh, I think it's bad. I think it's, it doesn't work very well. Uh, I think it's the worst way of doing things but i don't think it's unethical but someone from the free software foundation will disagree with that so i think the, the, that in itself is is in my mind is a slippery slope and then the second thing that i think is the slippery slope is was is when you take organizations that historically some people may think are doing unethical stuff and if they're trying to improve if they're trying to change sure. um that is the other thing so yeah it's there's no, there's no fixed solution to this. We can't fix this, right? We can't have a right opinion about it's this. It's just yeah, trying no. to have a discussion here, I think, is what it is. Right. Yeah. And the, the, yes, there is a whole big question about what is ethics and what is, what is unethical. Um, yes. The typical example that comes up here is where people don't want their software to be used for military purposes. Right. right? And let's take... That's the kind of thing we're talking about here. Um, companies... The, the, the pushback, at least, that I'm seeing is against companies who people would consider to be kind of on, in quotes, our side, the software industry, providing right. software consultancy and help for people doing governmental and military projects that we wish weren't the case. Is that a right. reasonable summary of so, where you, kind where of, you yeah. think the pushback think so. is? So the thing that's interesting about this topic is in uh, when we discussed discussing this uh, to get a little meta. I thought I knew my opinion very well, and I didn't think I'd have to think about it much. And the more I thought about it, the more my opinions changed and, and weren't what I initially anticipated them being, which was, oh, really? uh, to be frank, a little bit of a surprise to me. Yeah. So it's, what, what, I mean, I think that... So take what, us on what's that your, journey. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> I, what's the starting point about? My, wait, wait. my opinion while I was thinking about it shifted a little bit, and I think that uh, separating children from their families is, is in, inhumane, it's reprehensible, with no equivocations, and it needs to stop. Agreed. But I think well that said. I've learned that when something is a political hot button like this and you make snap decisions based on the instance, the framework that you then build is, is not usually the best framework for long-term sustainable success. And right. I think that a little bit, while ICE, what ICE is doing, I, I certainly could not disagree with more. I think it would be more constructive to understand and fix how the laws that enabled this got there, because ICE is really not able to make laws, right? They're a law enforcement agency. The, the laws that are there should need to be changed. And I think as a society, we need to reflect upon where we are and, and change a little bit there. So making this about ICE, I think, is a little bit myopic and will not result in the long-term change that I think is needed. But more broadly... You know, I, I think taking the Google May, Maven one, which is really the one that struck me the most. Uh, I, I know the ideology of many people at Google. We all three of us know a lot of people at Google. I think I yeah. know a lot of people don't trust Google. The people that are, work at Google, at least the ones that I know, they really there's an ideology there. They they attract a certain type of mentality, and they take. I know the do no evil thing gets a lot of flack, but I think they take it 
more seriously maybe than some people realize. I think a person at Google or, or many people at Google doing things like this, the whistle is far, likely, far more likely to get blown than at a place like Northrop or Raytheon or General Dynamics yes. or anyone in the military industrial complex, right? And so if we don't have more people with some real ethical sensibilities working on these military projects, we need more of them, not less. If the only people working on military projects are sociopaths, I don't know what future we're building. And that makes me a little bit nervous. So if everyone just throws up their hands and says, I want nothing to do with that, those are probably the people we most want involved because they are going to make ethical yeah. decisions. So leaving yeah, it to yeah. the, I just, it, I don't know. I, I didn't yeah. anticipate yeah. that being my opinion initially. You know, the other thing I think that feeds into this, particularly when we talk about the military, um, is I think different countries have a different general attitude towards their militaries, right? And in particular, the US. Like, it wasn't until I moved over here that I really understood the level in which um, Americans view the military. Like, the military plays a very active element of American consciousness, right? There is, there is, uh, it, it's, it's a social faux pas that if you see somebody in uniform, you don't thank them for their service. Like, that's a weird thing. In fact, there was a Curb Your Enthusiasm episode where Larry David touched on this, like he does in so many different things. And, um, you know, there is, there is a real focus around veterans and taking care of people who served in the military and stuff like that. There isn't anything like that in the same way in the UK, I don't think. No. Like, people are appreciative for people who are in the military, but it's like, okay, that's your job. Off you go. But in the US, it's it's completely different. So I think that part of this as well relates to, uh, I think this is one of the one of those hot button issues where, you know, there'll be some people who work at Google who are probably on the more conservative side of things who will see this as, you know, uh, okay, well, we're doing work that's in service of, of, of uh, you know, securing the borders and protecting our nation and all the rest of it. They don't necessarily see the ethical issue because they're broadly in favor of the military. I mean, that's the traditional divide right is that the republicans traditionally invest a lot more in the military they want a bigger military they want a smaller government the, de the democrats want don't really have an opinion on the published opinion on the military but they want a bigger government and they want the government to be more involved and protective of its people so i think what we tend to hear here is um typically i think the 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 left of the equation are much better at making noise than the right because i think bill maher touched on this once that Traditionally, all the crazies were always on the right, right? So you could say, like, those are the Tea Party lunatics, whatever, whatever, whatever. You just kind of ignore them. But I think particularly with social media and typically as people are, I think, historically a lot more liberal in their younger years. And then some people continue to be liberal, but some people become more conservative. People are much better at making noise. So I think what you're probably hearing from Google is not necessarily the full equation. I'm sure there's some people who, who are upset about this, but there are probably some people who are fine with it, but they haven't made as much noise about it. That's the other thing that kind of, I think, muddies the waters in my mind. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, both of you two seem to me, and uh, correct me if I'm mischaracterizing you do, please, but the traditional free software open source view has been, I mean, this is codified in the open source definition, right? There'll be no discrimination against fields of endeavor. And this yep. specific yep. discussion has come up a whole bunch on things like the Debian legal list going back 25 years now yeah. uh, the, the people have been complaining about the JSON license which says it can be used, it's, the software should be used for good and not evil saying that's not compatible with free software licenses right because there is no yeah. discrimination against fields of endeavor if someone takes your software and uses it in a nuclear submarine that's not your problem you are a neutral provider of software to the universe what the universe does with it is yeah. not your problem I I certainly used to think like that, but I'm mm. kind of coming around to the idea that we as an industry, we're pretty happy about the fact that basically the whole world dances to our tune now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I feel about this kind of the same way I feel about something like Google's responsibility for the news, which we've also talked about, right? where um, the, the historic Google view has been, 
we are neutral providers of search technology to the universe. Um, we just index the news. We don't. We don't. Uh, we don't champion any particular bit of it. And we've all said at least a little bit. No, we want Google and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and so on to take more responsibility. You're not just a neutral content provider or yeah, a neutral content exactly. channel anymore. You're not a platform on which news happens. You are making the news, whether algorithm, algorithmically, algorithmically or not. Yeah. And I feel kind of the same way about this. Interesting story. Um, there's uh, There was a group of um, senior engineers in, inside Google Cloud. They called themselves the Group of Nine. So someone in there has got a flair for the dramatic, if nothing else. Right? <laughs> I bet um, Alex Jones has they, covered these guys on uh, <laughs> the Infowars. Yeah, <laughs> they flat out refused to work on a, an internal security system thing, which Google needed in order to bid on a bunch of military contracts. And therefore, Google didn't end up bidding on those military contracts, which the 3,100 people who didn't want Google, 3,100 employees who didn't want Google to work on military contracts were very happy about. So this kind of internal activism does work. There is a large question about whether we think doing that's a good idea at all. Certainly. I mean, what, Jono, what you said there is, um, you know, do we want Google to stop doing this? But if you do want Google to stop doing this, I'm not sure that, Jeremy, your approach of step back and it's the politicians who need to decide, you can make a difference inside the companies. Now, granted, this just does mean that Raytheon do all the software who are not going to have inter the, the, the group of nine inside their complaining because yeah. they just get fired, possibly out of a cannon. But, <laughs> <laughs> but well, the, well, well, well here, here's the thing, right? I'm prepared to imagine, at least, that Google are better at this stuff than Boeing are. Right? Otherwise, why would the military approach them in the first place? There's no reason to even go and talk to Google if you already think Raytheon are better, if you think Lockheed Martin are better. So they're coming to Google because they're better. If Google say no, then the technology won't be as good. That, even, we, if Google, we, we, even, if, even if Google aren't better, they'll be cheaper. Well, yeah, maybe. It's my guess. I think it's, that's probably one of the major... I think, Could be. But yeah, I, so I, I, I do think the, this activism stuff... Activism, activism. God, I can't talk today. I don't know what's wrong. Um, I do think it works. The larger question of whether they should be doing it in the first place is another one. I grant you, but I don't think the other. The other thing that was interesting here, I think, is the Google one. I get uh, the Microsoft one. I get the Amazon one. I get a little bit less. It, it seems that people are at Amazon were upset that uh, Amazon recognition, which is a self-service AWS thing that anyone with a credit card can use was being used where Amazon has like a bunch of Department of Defense contracts that are just bidding on one that's like a $10 billion contract. They have an entire region dedicated to government agencies called literally GovCloud. So if you didn't want to provide services to the government, shouldn't have done GovCloud. So yeah. I don't get where their outrage of using a self-service recognition, like the, the Amazon one confuses me the most, I think. I think that I, yeah. I think that's yeah. kind of tied up with a lot of people who are unhappy with Amazon for 1.8 billion other legitimate reasons. Well, the the, uh, uh, the impression I get to compare it is, and this kind of reflects my view as well. Is I kind of have the same view of this that I do with um, with the with with my view on free speech, is that I think that freedom of speech should be protected in without turning it into that conversation, which is in itself a complicated discussion. But I generally believe that you should protect people's freedom of speech in, in all forms, and people should be able to say what the hell they want. Um, however, there are consequences in how you use that right, right? So if, you know, a good example of this is what happened with Roseanne recently, right? She posted that tweet, um, which was racist towards, I forget the name of the, the lady that it was targeted towards, um, and she lost her TV show. Freedom of speech so, does not mean freedom from repercussion. Exactly. 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 So, no, should, no, one like put, my, no one put her in prison for saying it or even suggested. Well, right. no, no one uh, sane suggested she ought to be in prison. And I believe for that she it, has. But no I, TV yeah. show for you. Exactly. <laughs> she should have every right to say that as much as she wants. Now, some people think that hate speech 
you know, should be, you know, again, that's a whole separate thing. We it won't is. get into it, that. It, but it is. And, the, and, I, you, and I, your I, view is more nuanced than this, and my view is, and Jeremy's view is, and ex- so on. Yeah. But this is not the discussion but, we're having. But, so. but the, um, <laughs> I have the same view with this. Like, I do think that Google should be free to go and bid these contracts if they think it makes sense, blah, 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 blah. But there's going to be consequences. And the only way in which you can understand those consequences is to understand your employees, right? You can't... Yeah. Like, if you basically say, uh, we're going to take on these contracts, and let's assume that, for the sake of argument, let's assume that 75% of Google's employee base are fairly liberal and are not going to want to have government contracts in place, then they can take that contract on. No one's stopping them, but there's going to be ser- serious cultural uh, re- repercussions on that. Now, Boeing, I'm guessing that more m- people at Boeing are generally much more conservative, Um or it's, it's clearly less of an issue working for a military contractor because you wouldn't work at Boeing if you did have an issue with it. <laughs> yeah. So the repercussions are going to be different. So, so it's, to me, that summarizes it. Like, you know, um, I don't think the issue in my mind here is, is it, it, it's entirely a cultural one, which is um, it really depends on the kind of culture you've got and the kind of employees that you've got because – if, if you don't have a clear handle on that, then I don't think you should be bidding for these kinds of controversial that, contracts. That, I think, is interesting because, hi- historically at least, the approach has been that the way you affect companies' opinions and stuff like this is consumer voices, right? Right. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm not necessarily sure that works. If you say stop using Google search engine and Gmail because they do military contracts, fine, you know. Uh, a few hundred people will do that, but they're the same sort of people who are boycotting bars that sell Coke because of what Coke did in that canning plant thing. And yeah. there are people who believe in that, but it doesn't actually move the needle very much. But employees do make a difference. Even if you're as big as Google, if 3,000 of your employees say, we don't want you to do this, you'll listen. Now, right. I mean, especially in tech... Ever- all tech companies really are recruiting companies in disguise, right? That was Don Marty said that a long time ago, and it took me a long time to come around, but I, I agree with them. It's if you lose, it, it, especially when in things like AI, which are such a fast moving field, if the top <coughs> AI people won't work for you because you're weaponizing AI, you are not going to be able to effectively compete. So I at think, which point you're no longer a top AI company, and the government stop right. coming to you. I absolutely take Jeremy's point that this means that. We can't go in there and improve it from within because all the contracts just go to who they were going to five years ago. You know, the military-industrial complex stays the military-industrial complex. And, yeah, I grant that point, but destroying the military-industrial complex is not on the table. <laughs> um, get yeah. I, And I'm honestly not convinced that through the magic power of JavaScript, we could get in there and make it better. <laughs> Yeah. That's a sad thought for humanity. It, it is a sad thought for humanity, but I think getting involved will not improve it, at which point everyone's now a military contractor. And the kill they're, they're, and the kill yeah. drones are better at being kill drones. And what did we get in return? The the, the this is gonna be a um a bit of a fleeting generalization, but I think that certainly in They're the best kind silicon Right. <laughs> but certainly I think in Silicon Valley, um, where a lot of these companies are based, and I think this applies. The other element that relates to this is how employees express these opinions to their company. So three and a half, was it three and a half thousand, something like that? Yeah, employees three, at 3, Google, 3,100 at Google. Yeah. Uh, signed this opinion. Whole which is a bu- which whole is, bunch of people at Microsoft as well. I haven't got numbers on that. but Now, I don't know how many people work at Google, but I'm sure it's in the hundreds of thousands, uh, if not if not it's if it's not in the hundreds of thousands it's going to be in like the 80 to 90,000 kind of range i know jeremy's probably looking it up right now cuz he's the one who does the research on bad voltage <laughs> yeah. um but you know 3,000 88,000 3,100 is a is a pretty small proportion of that and 5% I'm, of your people is a reasonably big deal i it, i i it's a i think it's actually a small deal i'd say 5% of your people is a small deal it's, Ooh, if it's, it's not, not if it's the right five percent, right? It's but this is kind of where I'm getting at. Is I'm guessing that the kind of people who felt comfortable um, voting in that in that uh, in that uh, poll or whatever it was 
are the kind of people who are in high demand in Silicon Valley. So because I think most people in the world, certainly people who don't live in Silicon Valley, are nervous about expressing their opinions for fear of of being maligned in the company, getting fired, all of those kinds of different things. I think people are nervous to share opinions that are contrary. We see this in teams, in companies every single day. So one thing that I think will be interesting is how to solicit the real views of your of your employees in a mm. way that prevents those kinds of repercussions. Like not, you know, it, it shouldn't frankly require people to be able to stand up and say, I'm willing to put my career at this company at risk to an express an opinion about a contract that relates to the military. There should be a better way of doing that. Because yeah. then I think you'll get a much more representative view because as we always see, we, there's always a small vocal choir in everything, in politics, in companies, in communities. And in many cases, that vocal choir doesn't actually represent the broader views of, of, of other people. And I don't, I'm not saying that doesn't here. It may represent the views and other people just are nervous to kind of speak up. But we just don't know. Right? Yeah, I mean, and I that, think, I think, is a bigger issue. I absolutely grant you that 5% of people saying thing X is not a big deal if the other 95% are equally committed to not X. At that point, yes, right. fine. But this, yeah, is five, exactly. this is 5% of people standing up say this, and I don't know whether there were 3,100 employees who also thought it was a great idea and they just didn't do a petition, or whether right. there aren't we just anyone don't know. on that side. We, we don't know, absolutely. Um, yeah. There is a whole bunch of literature uh, in the HR industry about how to do this, how to get the views of your employees in a way that does not make them feel targeted or victimised or at risk. But hardly anyone actually does it properly, Big, certainly from stories that I've heard. People say, OK, how do we do a survey, you know, where we say it's anonymous and all this kind of thing, and you go, well, basically like this. And they go, oh, no, but if someone says that sort of thing, we want to be able to know who it was. You know, you can't have that. <laughs> yeah. Because I that's also what everyone's afraid further. of. I think people don't trust that it's anonymous. No, and it's it, it is very hard to actually genuinely demonstrate to your employees. You it can is. have a go at the management, and if they manage to work out who you are, you won't be victimised for it. At which point, no one ever lost anything by just not speaking up in that kind of problem. It involves an internal culture of trust and so on. To some extent, it's a good thing that Google have that. The 3,100 yeah. people feel comfortable standing up and saying, I don't like this idea. Although, the, the, I suspect it's easier to person here. 3,006. Specifically with Google is, <laughs> I can think of, a bunch of times over the last several years where healthy internal conversation at Google has changed policy. And I don't know that that's happened previously at companies like IBM or, or you know, the last generation yeah. of technology companies. And I think that, you know, Stuart, you kind of brought up the difference between consumer activism and employee activism. I think employee activism has a, a really good chance to be really, really effective. I guess I, I think part of my point previously was I hope that we can focus employee activism in a more constructive way that isn't target. The thing about targeting at short-term issues like this is it's really hot for a second and then it fizzles out and yeah. you forget about it. Where I yeah. think if we can bridle this employee activism into more productive long-term change, I would rather see it go in that direction personally. That, that I think it, is a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, Microsoft published this blog post in January and no one said we're one in January because... no. Uh, um, depending on which side of the argument you want, either ice weren't in the news then or ice weren't as bastards then. <laughs> but, <laughs> but nonetheless, it almost seems like it almost seems like, and this is this is going to be a free idea uh, for everybody here. If you want to set up a business, and this, maybe this exists already, but um, my view here would be that um, in terms of how you gather that information from your employees, that I actually don't think you need to know the identities of the employees. What you need to know... Load, loads of companies that, provide this. You're going to say provide right. some kind of way of doing anonymous surveys, which are then communicated back. Yeah, there are like 50 companies. Yeah, but just like, in a, <laughs> I think, in, in a way where the employee can engage at the right kind of level. Yeah. Because uh, the thing that worries me about this is that, People don't trust the anonymous survey. So what no, happens is not. people basically go to Glassdoor and they basically yeah. kick and scream. Uh, and then that then the Glassdoor reviews get get referenced in the organization. I, I worked at a company once that went through this and um they, they get referenced in the in the organization and then people have to go and and try to improve how the gloss glass door reviews are all this kind of stuff. It becomes very complicated. So but yeah. 
I would like to change, pivot a little bit towards another element of this, which is um, when I used to work at X Prize, um, we uh, were working on, I'm, I'm going to leave out the details of this to protect the innocent, but we were working on a specific type of prize and there was a sponsor of this prize who was a large corporation and um uh and they're the kind of company where if you to look at them you'll immediately have an opinion right some people will be like uh you know this company doesn't necessarily do anything illegal or anything like that they're not locking kids up in cages or anything like that but (laughs) but they're they're, they were like a big industrial organization and some people had some ethical disagreements with that organization right right but the reason why they wanted to participate in this X Prize was because I think they were aware of that. I wasn't involved in the sponsorship discussions, but they were aware of their reputation. They wanted to do something about it. They wanted to make a positive philanthropic difference. So the other question here is, what about those cases where you're doing work for an organization that you might have an ethical ob- objection to, but they're actually trying to almost make amends in some ways? Uh, or at least do something to, to quote unquote, give back. Like, I was going to say, you... I'm a big believer in intent there. If their intent, and I don't know the specifics here, so I'm just going to generalize. Yeah. If their intent is to try to pay a little bit of money to improve their reputation so they can keep doing things that we don't agree with, that's exactly, a lot different yeah. than if they realize maybe the past uh, they could make some improvements on, and this is the beginning of, of a new kind of yeah. right, direction it... for them. I think those are two different answers for yeah me. There are, very different there yeah. are a whole bunch of companies who have a csr account a corporate social responsibility account or a department or whatever um and, and for some of them it's a real way of saying okay you know we we want to provide valuable services in the community we want to do better this is the start of it for others it's kind of well if we plant a few trees then we can keep throwing children into jet turbines and that's okay because we planted some trees <laughs> right like, no that's not how it works I, I don't you know the whole carbon offset principle where you fly a whole bunch of miles and then pay some money so someone plants a forest. I'm not necessarily sure I buy this, but I can see it for pollution. I do not think it applies to company ethics. Right, I would agree yeah. with that. Yeah, no, I think I think that makes sense. I think an example of that actually more recently is Facebook. Like, I think particularly in people on further on the right side of the political uh, uh, spectrum, there's kind of a pretty negative view of facebook that they're peddlers of face and fake news and all the rest of it but i don't know if this is if this has been happening where you guys are but in san francisco there is an abundance of advertising from facebook by with them basically saying we know we've had an issue with fake news we're trying to rectify it you know we're we're working on this that and the other trying to trying to you know resolve these problems and th- their intent is quite clear that they're this is not just you know we're trying to this is not misdirection that they're genuinely trying to actually rectify the problem that that's been highlighted there so but i think a lot of people are still gonna be like uh, it's facebook you know they just peddle fake news kind of thing <laughs> this is my skeptical face because what, what, because what you're describing and your skeptical voice in fact <laughs> this, what you're describing is indistinguishable from a company going oh man we're getting busted on not fixing the fake news thing better step up the we're good really advertising budget that is skeptical. <laughs> that is skeptical. Yeah, I mean, I I do think that they're actually trying to. We, I think they're trying we, to. Fix we it. shall see. But this is, I mean, this is a really big, wide ranging topic. So this seems like the sort of thing where having people chip in views. Yes. Yeah. Seems it's also a very seems interesting topic, to me. So it's... Yeah. Where do you draw the line? Is there some kind of clear, bright line test or a distinction or something? We go. This is okay, and this isn't which doesn't depend on where on the political spectrum you sit. Yeah, yeah I, I, exactly. I, I, I don't believe there is, but I'd be interested to hear if someone's got a theory about that. Yes, go and just go and do what he said. <laughs> What's that? Go, yeah, go and um, talk to us on um, uh, community.badvantage.org or, uh, or our Slack channel. We have a show in the can. We do. Thank you, gentlemen. That was a fun one. Um, I really enjoyed today. I, like, I think the ethics thing was fun to talk about. And it's nice having a conversation about something that relates to ethics without, like, with, with rational people. <laughs> like, <laughs> it doesn't turn into a poo-slinging competition, which sadly happens whenever I post anything on Facebook. 
Oh my god. So, there is uh, an obvious lesson to be learned here. Yes, there is. Yeah, just chill out people is the lesson. No, anyway, no. <laughs> that is not the uh, lesson. That, that is the, that is the lesson. At least chill out around me. That's all I'm expecting. <laughs> so um yeah, well, uh, go to the forum, community.badvoltage.org. Go to Slack and join us there. You can enter the Matrix to get to, to Slack as well. Um, I don't think we have anything else, do we? Are you guys speaking anywhere in the next few weeks? No. Uh, no. Not, in the, not in the next two weeks. No. no, I mean, two weeks from now, we're doing uh, Dash, which is a summit we're doing for Datadog, so that should be cool if oh. you're in New York City. If you listen to Bad Voltage, actually, this little unscripted, but if you listen to Bad Voltage and you're in New York City or want to fly to New York City, uh, I'll give you one free ticket. It's going to be really cool. we got a bunch of awesome speakers. Wow, really? Uh, I would like to fly yeah. to New York City, please. I, so I'm not going to... If, if you show up in New York City, I'll give you a free <laughs> ticket. <laughs> uh, uh, there we go. Uh, we got say. Paul Hill from NASA and a bunch of really awesome speakers from all over oh, the wow, industry. So it's what does yeah. Dash stand for? I think it's just a word in the English language. Oh right. Oh okay. I didn't know if it's stood for like. Oh no, it's not an acronym. It's just. Oh, I didn't know if the Dean was the conference dog, Dash. And it's, it was so cool name. So wow. So so you're being serious about this? If if someone is a bad voltage listener and wants to be in New York for that. You'll yes. give them a ticket to get into the event. Yeah, absolutely. It's July well, 11th they... and 12th. Uh, how, so you... how should they get in touch with you, Jeremy? They can hit me up on Twitter, hit me up in the forums, hit me up on Slack. I'm, I'm pretty easy right. to get a hold of, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's wow. Dashcon. If you want to look at the agenda or see what the conference is about before, it's Dashcon.io. Nice. Okay. Well, given, the fact, given the fact that this is a data dog conference, why on earth did you not call it DogCon? So it's not really a data dog conference. It's really more about um, building the, and scaling the next uh, generation of applications. And You're completely missing so. my point. It yeah, should no, be called DogCon. No dog. That's the most important point. Because <laughs> okay? no then people can say, that was DogCon great <laughs> oh, in, the, in the normal lexicon. <laughs> What? Although I am I am flying directly from Dash in New York to a little conference in Portland called CLS, so that'll be fun too. Ah, yeah, the Community Leadership Summit. Jeremy's keynoting, so it'll be fun. All right, excellent. We're, we're good. Thank you, fellas. Have a good one, people, Have and we'll one. see you in a few weeks. Bye.